the problem with viewing sales as an art, you, you have something that's not scalable and repeatable because everybody's a different artist. Some people are Da Vinci and some people are Picasso. Hello, Sales Nation, and welcome to the Salesman Podcast Live in partnership with HubSpot and recorded at the Leadership Summit in Chicago. On this episode, we have Bill Johnson. He is the CEO over at SalesView. And on this episode, I'm asking him, is sales just a numbers game? He gets super practical with this one. I think there's some really good insights for both inside and outside salespeople. You can find out more about Bill over at salesview.com, which is salesvue.com. We link to that and everything else that we talk about in the show notes of this episode over at salesmanpodcast.com. With all that said, let's jump in to today's show. Bill, welcome to the Salesman Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Will. You're more than welcome, sir. So we're going to dive into hopefully numbers, data analytics, all the nerdy stuff that I enjoy as well. I know the audience do as well. But just to set up the conversation, to frame it up, I'm going to ask you this, and it's cliche to ask, but I want to get your thoughts on it. Is sales a numbers game? Absolutely. (laughs) There is. uh, I have no doubt in my mind that sales starts with numbers. It's not a... People talk about the art of selling, and from day one when I started selling, it's been a numbers game. Why do we talk about the art of selling? Is this, I would, I immediately we've gone off topic here, which is good. Is the art of selling an opportunity to hide behind things that don't drive action? Yeah, and I think uh, the, the problem with viewing sales as an art, you, you have something that's not scalable and repeatable because everybody's a different artist. Some people are Da Vinci and some people are Picasso. And what sales leaders want is something that's repeatable and scalable across the organization. So So what matters within the numbers? Because clearly there's there's so many conversion points. There's so many data points that we can pull from and we use software to do that and manage it as well. But for the individual B2B salesperson listening, there is hitting your target because that's where you get your commissions, clearly. What other, <coughs> what other data points should we be focusing on? And then we can kind of tie this with process and implementing it and hopefully giving our audience uh, kind of a tool set here. Sure. So, you know, as a young sales rep, you, you start off with, all right, what's the macro view of the prospect base or the account base I can sell into? And, you know, there, there's this new movement around account-based selling and, you know, if, if there's multiple people in a functional discipline you can sell to, great. But the idea is you got to start with a number of prospects or leads to sell into. And then it becomes a numbers game in terms of how many people can I physically reach? How many <laughs> people can I physically have a conversation with? And, and is, is that, under, sorry to just interrupt there, but is that underrated? the amount of time that we should spend focusing on that because I have had sales manager, I've literally had this conversation and it sounds ridiculous. And we both laughed about it as we were going through it of he, our sales manager was given a target. He split that over the five reps that was in kind of Yorkshire and, and Leeds just equally, sure. which you know may not may or may not be the best way to go about it. If you try to be fair, but clearly we're, dry, we're here to drive revenue, not to be fair. Um, you know, it worked out good for me because I had more hospitals to sell to. So I'm not, I wasn't complaining at the time, but then we broke down the number of deals that needed to happen over the course of the year, then the number of deals that needed to happen over the course of the month. And then we started looking at the number of conversations that we needed to have. And it turned out that I needed to have some ridiculous number of conversations that wasn't physically possible. Right. So clearly some point further down the line or, or higher up the, the food chain, something had gone wrong here. Is that relatively common? I think the, the big challenge is less the problem you were identifying and more the problem of most sales reps do not understand what the average connection rate is. So if I pick the phone up and I own a marketing services company in conjunction with SalesView, it's right why we built SalesView. And um, I know we logged 1.5 million calls over the last three years. And the average connection rate for that business, if we pick up the phone and dial 100 times, the average connection rate is between 6 and 12%. So that necessitates your following up on between 88 and 94% of the people. And the fundamental challenge is you have all these, you have a lot of sales trainers who say, you need to do research before you pick the phone up. And 
I'm at the opposite end of the spectrum of that because I know the 6 to 12% connection rate. So if a rep does 20 minutes of research, goes to LinkedIn, goes to the company's website, and identifies a, a couple of problem areas that their solution may help, pick the phone up and call, they've got a 1 in 12 chance of reaching that end user. And guess what? They just wasted 20 minutes. And so now you've done that 11 times for that one conversation. And, and the prospect may or may not be interested, even though you've done all the research. I would much rather see a sales rep trained and enabled to have a 60 second conversation extolling a company's value proposition, discussing pain points that they've helped others with and make, instead of making 10 dials a day or 15 dials a day, make 80 to 100 dials a day because that same connection rate is going to occur. And so now if I make 100 dials, I'm going to have six to 12 conversations versus if I make 15 dials, I might have one. And that one may not go anywhere because I know that not every conversation yields an outcome that's positive, a meeting or whatever. And so that's the first component that I think sales management and sales reps need to understand. This is really refreshing. This is absolutely the opposite end of, and clearly we're here doing an inside sales event. So this skews some of the conversations that we're having. But most of the conversations I have on the podcast are, we should be using social selling. We should be touching beforehand. We should be uh, you know, increasing the relevancy. We should be doing all this kind of stuff. But what you just described was the practicality of all this. Of That's all nice. But if you're only going to have one conversation a day on the back of that, if, even if that conversation is incredible and that leads to a deal, which, you know, clearly that doesn't happen every time, there's more conversion points down the line, sure. which we'll get to, you're not setting yourself up for success. So where is the balance here between, and you, I think you alluded to it with the 60 seconds of the initial phone call. Where is the balance between getting on the phone, asking questions and sucking value from the conversation because you, you, it's polite to know at least it's somewhat of what's going on and that you, you're somewhat going to be a fit. Where is the balance with the research? Is it the, and again, it gets really practical if you can, Bill, of is it the company size, the right decision maker, and a few other pointers, and that's enough to be to w be worth calling that individual. Sure, that, I mean, that's a great point. It's, what I would tell you is, all right, if you're a brand new company and have no customers, you, you're gonna paint with a wide brush. because <laughs> you, you don't know who's gonna be the early adopter. But once you start to gain some insight and say, hey, financial services is an industry that is moving towards, you know, milk that financial services vertical or milk the retail, milk, what's there from a targeting standpoint and do your 100 calls a day, send out 100 emails a day. But when you have that 60 second conversation, because you've interrupted their day, I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm trying to sell you on taking a 30 minute or a 60 minute discovery call or a meeting. That's when all the research becomes very important, you know, from a social standpoint, from a website standpoint, finding what content exists, that, that's where it's really important to have a meaningful conversation because I, wanted, I want the prospect to understand that I do understand what potential problems they could have or potential points of pain. And I also want to be in a situation where the, I know what my solution can do for them. So is it, is it okay to say perhaps that we should be slightly selfish on the front end and not invest t too much time into an individual before we know that they're going to be somewhat of a fit. Is that a fair way to with, describe it? Without a doubt, without a doubt. Why aren't we selfish? You know, um, <laughs> because, you know, because somebody has read a book that says social selling is it. I mean, I, I <laughs> talked to LinkedIn yesterday and, and, you know, God bless LinkedIn. They've created a nice $26.5 billion exit for <laughs> themselves. And, but they use their own tool and they said, you know, they would never call, they would never call somebody who hasn't socially engaged with them. And now, you know, LinkedIn has a very well-defined brand. Everybody knows them. If I'm at SalesView, for instance, we don't have the brand presence that LinkedIn does. So no, nobody really, nobody. There's a lot of people who don't know what we do. And when they find out what we do, they're, they're interested in hearing more, interested in seeing more. But the idea of trying to engage them socially, they're going to look at who's SalesView. I don't know who they are. You know, so what we're trying to do is, Take that 60 seconds, extol 
the value proposition of our product that we can help make sales reps 50 to 300 percent more productive and efficient and put a process and methodology in place so that we can do a demo and do a more detailed understanding and that's what i would tell you you know 99 out of 100 startups should be doing yeah and you know the challenge that a lot of young sales reps sdr teams have is they're given products that make it easy to spam people. And I do define it as spam. I'm, I'm a guy that has 21,000 unopened emails <laughs> in my inbox. Because if I don't know who you are, I'm not responding. You know? well, let, let's put into context of that then in your position. So I have experience selling to CFOs within the NHS. And that is a di the C-suite is a different conversation, a different tax. They've, you know, you clearly you have different priorities versus the end user of a product, for sure. example. If one of our audience, Sales Nation, was going to get you on the phone and they were able to get through and they were able to get that connection, what should they be? What should that first 60 seconds be to get your attention and then to align you up for a discovery call in the future? The fundamental challenge that I see in my role is a rep might see something on LinkedIn or see something on it and they try to personalize the email. And then they'll send me eight emails. This is my, <laughs> this is my eighth email. I don't know if you got the previous seven. And it's like, you know what? Pick the phone up and call me. I will, I will say this. A rep that picks up the phone and calls me four to eight times I will, I, will, I will reward them for their persistence. But they have to have, you know, a value proposition that's willing to listen, you know. Hey, we're going to help make your sales team 100% more productive than they are. We're going to help Im improve your close rates by 50%. We're going to make it easier for you to do your end of month close from a financial standpoint, get it done in a day versus a week. You know, things that are relevant to me, you know, I am going to be a little more, um, interested in hearing what they have to offer versus, um, you know, it, it cracks me up because I, I, I just got a, an email two days ago talking about how this company is working with Disney, IBM, and Boeing. Well, last time I looked, sales views not of a size that Disney, IBM, and Boeing are, you yeah. know, and, and so it's like, have some relevance. And that, I imagine that is a templated email that they got from somewhere else on some blog that thousands of other salespeople have read the blog post they're using as well. All right. Well, we see it all the time today with um, Salesforce guy that Aaron talked. Ross and predictable yeah, yeah. revenue. His predictive templates. revenue. Yeah. You, you see that all the time. It, it worked in 2003. Yeah. Can you please let me know who's with, responsible? With an incredible product as well on the back right, of right. it. Right. Yeah. Can you tell me who's responsible for accounting in your firm? And, you know, it's like nobody changes the Aaron Ross verbiage i mean it's like they take it verbatim and it's like okay if you're gonna if you're gonna use the predictable revenue thing at least be a little more creative and think about what you're saying because you're like a hundred emails i get that day yeah so when you, you use the word reward before if someone calls you and there's you know there's a persistence and there's value to the calls you think sure, that right. you're not, you're not going to waste your time clearly you're a busy guy um so you're not just going to pick up the phone to anyone but when you say reward someone I've done lots of interviews recently with CEOs and VPs of sales and practitioners, you know, people who are own companies or in the trenches versus sales experts who wrote a book 10 years ago and have just done keynote speaking since. Um, I'm, I've got a real focus on practitionership at the moment. And this reward seems to come up often and often and often. Is that something that you think that most ex executives, to use that, that phrase, they will reward someone for being persistent, for you know, putting in the time and effort to try and get in contact with them? I think so. I know I will. And I know that the people I've talked to from a peer standpoint do it. I will tell you that, you know, in, in the sales of our own product, sales view, you know, we're targeting VPs of sales or we were targeting VPs of sales. And the challenge was as a former VP of sales, I'm not at my desk very often. And the time I have to return my own sales team calls would pretty much exhaust a day. So I would, <laughs> I would never, I, I never had the time to return a sales rep calling me to sell something. And that's the same challenge we face at SalesView. And so what we did identify is 
sales operations directors, VPs of sales operations, Salesforce admins are a better target for us because the VP of sales might go and say, hey, Will, I've got this challenge. I'm trying to figure it out. And that sales ops person, that Salesforce admin, does have the VP of sales here. He also is the, the person that's bearing the brunt of, hey, we need to fix this. I need, you know, I need more revenue. I need more. <laughs> and so what we have found is we can drive a lot more meetings with that person and extol our value proposition. And I don't like to sell up, but it's been a much easier road to hoe doing it that way versus trying to target a VP of sales. And I'm not going to say it's going to work for everybody, but I think finding out who your audience is that makes it easier, that understands the problems that your solution solves, um, it does play into that math game. If I can target 100 people who know the problems that exist in the organization and are willing to champion it across the organization, I'm far better off. And is that a discovery from a data point of you have 1% connection, whatever the numbers are, 1% connection with VPs, but then 12% connection with that individual below them who can sell up? Yeah, I would, I would love to tell you we figured it out mathematically, but what, <laughs> what, what ended up happening is the few VPs of sales that we got would say, go talk to Will, he's my Salesforce admiral, he's my sales ops guy, I'm, I'm on the road the next five days, I don't have time to take a look at it. And so we were getting, we were getting pushed down, whether we wanted to or sure. not, and, and so, hey, if we're getting pushed down, why not start there, because and we found out they're a lot easier to get a hold of. And so the connection rate uh, from a conversation standpoint, yeah, it went up from like 1% to 12%, and it, was, it happened on dial number two or three versus <laughs> dial number 12 or 14. Yep. So yeah, it worked out well. Makes total sense. Okay, so we've got the initial dial, then uh, what's the next metric that we should be monitoring or the next most important one? Yeah, so I'm a big believer in this concept that we introduced called the math of sales. And it's, a, it's something anybody can calculate manually, but it's the idea of, all right, if I make 100 dials, what's my connection rate? And now we've talked about it being 6 to 12% on average. And then what I'm interested in is when I have a conversation what, what percentage of those conversations are converting to a discovery call, a site survey, a demo, whatever, you, whatever stage that I start to gauge the prospect's interest. And that can be um, really fascinating to look at because not only does the connection rate change, but if I go back to my early sales days where um, or VP of sales at a primo marketing automation vendor back in the early days of marketing automation. And we struggled to get our foot in the door. And then we started finding out that financial services was a vertical that was responding better, faster, quicker. They had a lot of discretionary income and we helped them manage that better. And, and so it was a question of, all right, if we're getting more conversions, in the financial services vertical versus retail or versus manufacturing or some other industry, you know, and, and it was sizably different. It was, sure. you know, it wasn't a difference between, it was probably a difference between 2% conversion rate and 12% conversion rate. So when you got a 6X delta there, hey, let's exhaust it. Let, let's make sure we target every financial services vertical, every financial services company within that vertical, and then we'll figure out where to go next. So we, is that the process the whole way? Is it, I know it's, I'm going to say, is it as simple as that? Clearly, there's not simple. You need software to, to manage it. Otherwise, the salespeople aren't going to be doing any selling. They're going to have the, the nose uh, deep in a spreadsheet or the CRM or whatever they're kind of manually inputting it into. Sure. But is it as simple as that of, we track the conversions at each point. Maybe the low hanging fruit is one conversion point, which is super low, which is throwing off everything else of, um, you may know the maths off the top of your head better, but there'll be a, there'll be either the beginning or the end that will make a, a compounding difference between everything else that comes through the pipeline. So is that what we should be doing? Should we be looking for these these weak conversion points? And is that where the math of sales comes into it? Well, it, it, absolutely. So it's where it starts. And you still need to tie back the pipeline and opportunity data because in my previous example around financial services, if I schedule 
12 meetings with financial services companies this month and six months later, none of them have converted to paying <laughs> customers. You know, we're getting rewarded for top line growth as, as heads of sales. And conversely, retail might have only scheduled two meetings, but guess what? Both of those converted. So that you, you can't ignore what the level of interest is without paying attention to the pipeline. But um, I do believe you, you have to understand what the um, conversation to conversion rate is. Because if people are taking a meeting, taking time out of their day, and look, there's, there's a lot of noise coming at every prospective client today, whether it's other vendors, whether it's job challenges or whatever, you have to be in a position where you can, um, if you're getting them interested in spending an hour of their day, I eventually think that you are going to convert them into a paying customer. Case in point, at, at a Primo, for instance, um, we did hire an inside sales team. It was an SDR function before SDR became in vogue back in 2000 and 2001. And after I left a Primo, the VP of sales who replaced me said, I don't believe in this inside sales stuff. I'm getting rid of it. You know, reps are going to hunt their own deals, blah, blah, blah. And uh, two years later, I got a call from the CEO saying, you know, that inside sales process you put in place really worked. It drove about 85% of our new name business in 2003 and 2004. The challenge was we didn't understand that our average sales cycle was 18 months. And so the meetings that your team set in 2001 yeah. and 2002 have now closed. And guess what? We don't have a pipeline. And, and so that's the understanding of if we get the conversion, what's what's that sales cycle like and I am talking about outbound work and there's a big difference between outbound prospects and inbound prospects I mean I think everybody who's watching your podcast would agree is that an inbound lead to somebody who's actively has an active project and looking to solve it has budget an outbound prospect may not have any understanding of wow I didn't know that this existed <laughs> and it could help us with this, you know, point of pain. And, and so there is a huge difference in the sales cycle, but tracking all that back to conversation, to conversion, to pipeline is crucial to, to measuring, you know, quote unquote math of sales. So we'll wrap up with this bill. So my background is medical device sales. I would go into theaters. I would be speaking to surgeons, procurement teams, CFOs on the bigger deals within the NHS. And I had the sales process down. We never had a CRM just to kind of qualify the fact that there was no, very little quant of all of this. There was no inputting of data. Um, but I would do all this in my head. So the, I'd be following the sales process. I'd know that, you know, qualify and go through the objections, all the, the, the basic sales 101 stuff. But I, I didn't have any conversion points. Should we engineer conversion points if they don't exist already, like in my case? And do we do that by creating like a binary moment where it's a yes or no is that the only way we can put a conversion point in place that's a fair question um i think a lot of it depends on the product you're selling and the functional discipline you're selling to you know if i'm selling a widget to a manufacturer who has to buy widgets all day long you know you, you probably doesn't make sense if you're if you're selling a complex solution that has multiple checkpoints and multiple constituents that, you know, you have an economic buyer, you have a technical buyer, you have a coach, you have a champion. Yeah, you probably would want to do that. And, it, it and would, and be, would an example of that be, as you use the word champion in the NHS, that was, that was all of it. If you had the surgeon on board who was super excited to use your products, they would champion it across the organization. So is that the binary point of, I have a champion on board? Right. That's conversion point number three or four. Is that right. what we're searching yeah, for? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Amazing stuff. Well, I could dive into this a whole lot further and dive into the numbers and I'm sure you've got some real interesting analytics from the industry and whether you can share it from your customers as well of what works, what doesn't and misconceptions. So we'll perhaps have you on the show in the future to dive into all that, Bill. But I've got one final question, something that I ask everyone that comes on the show and that is, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at selling? The big thing I would tell myself today is understanding the numbers for every... Ter you know, I was always a territory rep and I'm a dinosaur because you know, I work for 
every company I worked for didn't have an inside sales team. That didn't become in vogue till 1999, <laughs> 2000. So I had to go hunt what I was going to, I had to hunt what I was going to kill. Yeah. And I don't think if I look back and tell you, honestly, did I really understand every potential deal in my territory? And I would bifurcate the squirrels and the chipmunks from the elephants because the squirrels and the chipmunks, those deals could happen quicker. And the elephants may take six months, nine months, 12 months. But you got to have the ele- the elephants are where you reap your rewards. You yeah. know, th- those are the ones that you can go buy that Porsche or whatever. <laughs> and uh, the squirrels and the chipmunks are what keeps your wife happy. It's a fair, fair way of putting it. I yeah. appreciate that. Um, I know my kind of medical device sales, I would typically have one elephant a year and it's somewhat risky because if, if I didn't hit that elephant, if we didn't close that deal, the, uh, you know, well, you'd be getting sacked because you'd be like miles off your target. But whether it was luck or uh, blind kind of, well, probably blind luck is the answer in, in my scenario, in my case. But that was always the, I was always mo- motivated to get the elephant as well versus the squirrels. And so maybe that's, let, let me ask you this. And we'll wrap up with this. Is the data on conversion points and all this kind of thing and the, the science of sales that says there's a certain deal size within the industry that we should all be going for, or should it be a mix? Uh, it should it should be a mix because the squirrels and the chipmunks, you are, uh, you know, you're going to have a higher conversion rate because you're typically dealing with somebody who may know the pro- points of pain and the problems. The elephants, I mean, there's a challenge because it's harder to identify who's going to coach you, who's going to be your champion, and what the buying process is. You know, who all needs to be involved? Yeah. And is it four people? Is it 12 people? Is it, you know, we were at a meeting for a major financial institution three weeks ago. We had 40 people wow. <laughs> attend the meeting. And we still don't know who's going to own the process. Yeah. But it is, it's one of those things where, if, if we can land them, it's not even an elephant. It's a big whale. <laughs> so, you know, you, you, you take those when you can get them, but it is about trying to manage it. And so I would tell you there is a difference between the squirrels and the chipmunks and the, you know, the, the big elephant slash whale deals you can chase. I appreciate that because we started the show, we've been super practical about the, the dials and that being the dictation versus you know, all the the fancy social selling stuff that we're all being told is so fantastic, but I don't know the the amount of data that proves that. But getting practical, and then I like this at the end as well, being practical on that, because I do many shows, I like talking about the big whale stuff, that's the exciting things, but if that's that's a risk, if that's the potential upside of that, but that's not what pays your bills, and data shows that as well, then perhaps it's worth focusing on the, the squirrels occasionally. And with that, Bill, tell us a little bit about sales view and where we can find out more about you as well. What can I answer for you from a questioning standpoint? Because I think the so sales view is a, is a backstory, is an outgrowth from a marketing services company that I started in 2004 that does the SDR function as a business. We do appointment setting. And, um, and what we learned early on was to be very process focused. We had an Excel spreadsheet that we would say, we're going to call into these executives that we're targeting on behalf of our clients eight times over a two week period or 12 times over a four week period with an email call call and a specific cadence called out and um, excel was great with four employees <laughs> not so great with 20 and so we built the first version of sales before that we automated the excel spreadsheet putting a cadence in place and use that product internally for six years and then decided to rewrite the application natively in the Salesforce ecosystem. We bet our business to writing against the lead contact account and opportunity objects. So there is no data migration. There is no data integration. When a rep logs an activity in SalesView, it's logged directly against the Salesforce lead contact account or opportunity object. And our average client sees anywhere from a 50% to a 300, you know, 300% productivity increase across the, the realm. So if a rep is logging 30 activities a day, it's not uncommon to see them log 60 to 90 activities a day using SalesView. And what we hear from sales reps is we routinize their day. They come in in the morning and they know what they need to do. It's not a question of, I've got a the Salesforce task list and I've got a hundred people on it, and I might call this person, I might call this person. 
there's, a, there's no rhyme or reason in terms of how they approach it. With SalesView, you've got a certain number of people you need to call, a certain number of people you need to email, and then we're analyzing the connect and conversion rate and coming back to you and saying, hey, guess what? You know, you shouldn't make four calls for this group, you should make eight, and you shouldn't make six calls for this group, you should make four. Mm. And so what we're trying to do is not only are we making the reps more productive, we're giving them the insight to help them sell more. And that's what, you know, it, it, as a career sales professional, I love getting emails. I love seeing the reviews on the app exchange where reps are very excited about using our platform to help make their day easier. Because let's face it, it has <laughs> never been harder to sell something to somebody than it is today. I mean, and, still. you know, coming back to the social selling, comment I'll, i want one last comment there yeah the average person at the whale or the elephant that we're selling to isn't a big social per user so they're not you know they, they they might be on linkedin they might accept your invitation to connect with them but they're not reading streams they're not paying attention to twitter or any other things they're you know they're 50 years old and uh they're not engage socially and so getting them socially engaged in your solution it's hard it's hard i think that's as simple to sum up as the market is the market isn't it that, it, that it, might change i over love time. that line the market is the market i it love might change that change over time millennials might age up into those positions of power but you know that's potentially five ten years away at the the kind of sure. the very early so i appreciate that i appreciate the practicality of it all and i thank you bill for joining us on the salesman podcast thank you